uh, as well as the European Commission. Then in the first session of yesterday, our panelists show that disclosure mandate, competition, and also nudges or soft paternalism may not work well. So what else can we do to improve the situation? Um, in particular, can regulation play a more important role, especially in the digital world where consumers face an unprecedented amount of information and choices? And how could or should we regulate that? And this brings us to the topic of uh, this session, consumer policy as a regulatory instrument in the digital world. And we have an excellent lineup of speakers uh, from economics and computer science. We have Prof Professor um, uh, Danilo Montesti, Jan, uh, Professor Jan Kramer, and also Professor uh, Fiona Scott Martin. So each speaker has 20 minutes, and I'll open up the camera around the one minute mark and perhaps jump in when your time is up. Uh, so unfortunately, um, today's session discussion uh, pulled out uh, last minute for personal reasons. So we will have a bit slightly longer Q&A. Um, and just to remind our speakers, please only turn on your camera or microphone when you are speaking. This is just to save bandwidth and optimize the viewing experiences of our audience. Thanks very much. Um, so our first speaker is Professor Danilo Montesti from University of Bologna. He's going to talk about um, can digital regulation rebalance the consumer role fostering competition? So um, the floor is yours and I will start the timer. Thank you, Will. Uh, let me share the screen. I hope you can see everything. Yes, correctly. very clearly. Thank you. Thank you. So um, th this talk is about uh, really digital platform and uh, competition. Uh, there is not a paper for this presentation. Uh, um, and uh, so this is an effort uh, combined with, uh, um, with the help of uh, uh, Flavio Bertini that is a postdoc. Um, I will actually, sorry, I will uh, um, briefly touch uh, uh, three points. Uh, the first, uh, uh, how digital platform have come to dominate the market. Uh, and then uh, um, quickly review what is my understanding of the uh, proposed standalone interventions and if they could make it. Um, we will spend more time on the third bullet, which actually is a, a, a re-elaboration of a, an idea that came up uh, last year to introduce a middleware, so a technical solution to try to, to rebalance uh, the role of the consumer and competition somehow. So um, I think uh, we all know that any um, uh, internet-based company is leveraging on, uh, on what is called the, the network effect or also known as the metacal flow. And so uh, this says that essentially if you have uh, maybe a few thousands of users, you don't really have a, an important value, but if you have uh, something in order for uh, hundreds of millions, uh, uh, then the, 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 the value of your platform uh, start to really to kick in. And actually, this, this law said that uh, the importance of the value of the business goes about uh, like the square of the number of the users. Uh, this is an important element to say that uh, this is part of the digital uh, world, the digital platform, and we cannot do much about it full stock. Um, there is a, um, another um, element, uh, which instead uh, is what I tend to call the path to the ecosystem. Most of these digital platform, even things that you may not uh, immediately recognize as digital platform, for instance, if you take Tesla, you may consider it uh, a car producing company, which is true, and not, let's say, um, company that is dealing with mobility instead, they tend to have a, roughly all these platforms the same approach. Okay, they built on the network effect. They know that the first mover can entrench himself and swallow up the competition. And they are roughly all try to perform all kinds of uh, uh, integration. So they start with vertical integration or the horizontal or the conglomerate integration. And this means that essentially they they all try to build a complete end-to-end -end service. They tend to bypass the incumbent and they tend to 
obviously absorb the, com the competition uh, that they have around. So if you look at what have, is going on in these days, uh, you will not have difficulty to figure out that maybe Amazon Prime Video uh, is one example. Actually, they, 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 uh, some time ago, they built their own uh, um, production, let's say, pipeline. So they built their own series. More recently, they decided to, to acquire MGM and also to make an, uh, uh, quite a, um, a, a, a large agreement with uh, Spielberg to produce high quality series. Why they do this? Obviously, because they, as we say, they, they, they tend to build a complete end-to-end -end solution and they know what the customer want to look. They collect this data. Obviously, we know that they profile us and they they do it uh, in, a, in an excellent way. Obviously, they are not alone in this context. Maybe there is Netflix that's doing something similar and so on and so forth. The other element is that they also uh, tend to uh, fill in uh, other sectors, uh, digital sectors. You know, Amazon moved from selling books that they didn't even uh, own, and they move in maybe delivering drugs and food and other services. Um, but uh, uh, if there are sectors they haven't touched, maybe finance, banking, or insurance, or uh, broadband, is because they have, I, that's my understanding, believed not to do so, because uh, this would show that they are, tend to be too dominant. So uh, these elements are very often combined together in what is sometimes known as the socio-technical ecosystem that use the network effect, the exploitation of the data, obviously, to figure out what users want. And also a bit of what I call the platform dependent users. I mean, users tend, once they know the, uh, the way of operating on a specific platform, the classic example is Apple, with the user interface of the user experience that is very uniform across different devices and different uh, process, they, they tend obviously to hawk the customer. Yesterday, um, I heard several people talking, uh, especially Paul, about uh, consumer inertia. Here there is actually uh, um, uh, the convenience that the users uh, uh, tend to trade for privacy. Um, not being an economist or, or a lawyer, although sometimes I support the teams of lawyers uh, before court or um, authorities, I have, I have a special feeling for the data collection, the central role that data has in this digital platform. We are all aware that the, this data is being collected uh, inside the platform uh, for which we, on which we, 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 we do something. Uh, so any piece of data that we provide or we don't provide uh, with the time that we are accessing the devices and so on, and so on give information about us. Um, I'm sure that you are also aware of the fact that uh, these digital platforms are now hubs or to access other platforms through services like single sign-on, essentially, you don't need to open an account, uh, let's say, if you want to read a specific uh, newspaper. And uh, you can actually instead use the account that you have with one of these major digital platforms. And then obviously these uh, extend outside the reach of the specific digital platform. Um, to one account, uh, one of these digital platforms connect uh, a, a formal agreement with other four millions different digital platforms. So obviously they can collect data and trace uh, the activity that we perform in these, these other digital platforms. Uh, on top of this, uh, there is also the data collection that they perform outside all these, uh, let's say, four million plus one platforms, because they tend to integrate devices that uh, we, uh, we use maybe for, again, for because they are very convenient for payment or, or for uh, other reasons. Even your doorbell can leak data about uh, the behavior that, uh, that you have. So I asked myself, how do they survive uh, to regulation? Um, my understanding, not being uh, an expert uh, on, the, on, the, on the law side, is that uh, there is this um, act that goes back to 1996 that has given a wide freedom uh, in the early stage. And then it has made later on difficult uh, uh, to regulate uh, uh, their behavior. And, um, but uh, there is another element that I think uh, uh, should be pointed out is that compared to traditional brick and mortar business, uh, uh, digital platform have some additional features that are very important. 
The first one is the speed of innovation that no one with a brick and mortar business can match, not even the financial industry that is notorious to be quick. Uh, uh, also the ability to evolve, intercept new users and new services. Uh, again, if there is a sector or a, a group of services that they don't do is because that's my understanding, they don't want to do it uh, at this point of time. Another characteristic is the homogeneity with which they operate across different sectors, across different uh, maybe uh, platforms. And obviously uh, regulation has not been able to keep up with these tech trends. And the one that we have up here to be uh, unfit, uh, let's say for the purpose. Um, so uh, I ask myself, how do we tackle the power concentration problem? Um, for me, power concentration means data concentration. Um, I understand that there is a little agreement about how to respond to this situation of data concentration. Um, uh, uh, they, they, they propose the approach that I've seen are somehow a bit classic, like new regulation, uh, using maybe starting from the GDPR and other, uh, let's say, work in progress, like the Digital Service Act, the Digital Market Act, or the European Electronic Identity that has that shown in this pandemic period that uh, it doesn't really work for the time being, at least. Other approach, like breaking the up uh, as uh, it's some problem that you know better than me. Uh, I understand the ex post analysis, maybe also not very, popular because if you have authorized a merge, why should five or six letters here later uh, um, backtrack? Because five, six, eight years later, these are completely different platforms. There is a completely different uh, uh, business environment for them. Uh, recently instead, which means last year, there has come up this uh, new proposal, which um, here is in the reference number seven that you find at the end of the slides uh, that I will show. Uh, uh, this proposal is essentially saying, uh, why don't we add a middleware, um, so a piece of software essentially, acting as a technical broker on top of an existing digital platforms. And I think that this idea, although has its own limit, has um, some, um, some interest and worth uh, looking at and maybe use this to, 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 to make a step forward. So, uh, recognize that there is a need of uh, middleware means that uh, essentially we have uh, uh, we, we need to add a, a piece of software doing something that will be more precise uh, uh, shortly. Um, so here, first of all, what is a middleware? As the name says, something that is in the middle of, some, of something else. So here we have a user that want to access to their preferred uh, digital platform when put some names, uh, random names. There are many others, but uh, for the time being, I think we understand what we are talking about. And the idea is that uh, the middleware will be these uh, green uh, uh, squared um, uh, boxes that will actually mediate the data flow uh, uh, um, between the user and the specific digital platforms. Here, the basic idea of the author of this proposal is that uh, uh, there are, should be also different middlewares and the user should choose the more appropriate middleware. Uh, maybe one is um, uh, passing less information to the digital platform or is more um, sensitive to specific type of data and so on and so forth. So to figure out how this middleware could work, um, we can use an example here. Uh, why it could work? Because actually the the reference that I'm talking about doesn't uh, give much details about how to use it. So we try to infer how it could work. And I hope to be uh, uh, correct in, the, uh, in, in explaining what they have in mind. Um, so look, at, on the left, we have uh, the traditional situation that we call before the introduction of middleware, where we have a user, we've chosen one digital platform Imagine in, with a simple example, Alice want to buy a product or a service from this platform and, uh, and that's what it's doing today. And we know that uh, there is an activity of uh, 
uh, you know, uh, searching, uh, browsing, comparing, and eventually order a product or a service if it's a product will be also delivered at home. Okay. And in this process, all the uh, data of uh, this activity, when you do, when you don't do, how many devices do you have connected at the same time? Uh, um, uh, what are you comparing with? And so on, all these type of data that I suppose Jan in the next uh, talk will uh, detail more and, and classify, uh, will be collected and attached uh, for a, a very uh, precise, let's say, a, a profiling of your, uh, let's say, interest or at least your activity. Um, the use of middleware, so let's look at this other part on the right, and after, um, it means that uh, Alice will not act if we, the middleware would be introduced directly with a specific digital platform, but we'll choose, as we said, one middleware um, platform that will actually try to pass the minimum possible data to the digital platforms. So this means that essentially most of the uh, data uh, collected about the user and the activity that the user is performing on the, on the platform will not be in possess of the digital platform itself, but will be uh, best uh, stored in the middleware. Maybe they will not be even collected because that uh, is something that the middleware should uh, um, say, we, we don't collect your data. So this is a very shortly, it's the proposal of introducing this middleware. Um, one critics that could be done to this proposal is that uh, this is more a problem shifting. I mean, uh, uh, who will control the middleware? And what if uh, it gets bigger and bigger up to reproposing the same problem that it's supposed to solve, okay? But still, uh, we believe that this platform, this idea of, uh, uh, let's say, um, introducing, um, let's still call it a middleware, as its own merit. Um, but it's a, as its own merit, if we uh, try to bind together the, let's say, technical solution that here you find on the left with what I called a new regulatory solution that you find on the right. So the technical solution is essentially to, uh, uh, um, to tell to this, this platform that they have to perform what we, um, here we call data separation, data portability, and therefore we need some open standard for data exchange. Uh, obviously data exchange done under the user uh, control and that uh, when he or she would decide to do so. On the other, uh, on, the, on, the, on the regulatory solution side, you need to have some idea of um, auditing what these digital platforms are doing. We need data audit and data processing audit. So this idea, uh, um, as you can imagine, uh, if we turn back to the previous example, um, uh, will have uh, some effect. Let's look at, uh, at the data separation and portability for, for the time being. Well, uh, here on the top, we have uh, what I call the fine grain profiling. Uh, my understanding of the GDPR is that uh, you must uh, be, um, give the consent for, for being profiled. Once uh, you, 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 you consent, uh, the, the, the death profiling can, uh, can start and there is not much you can do uh, apart from maybe withdrawing the consent and, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So yeah, we still have Alice uh, doing searching, browsing, comparing and ordering things. Uh, if she act directly with the Amazon, Amazon will know uh, all the activity on the platform and eventually could deliver the product or even the service. But if instead we introduce this, the middleware that, uh, uh, this is a, a, a let's say a, a middleware that would decide to do a rough classification. So say that the user is in their thirties, uh, lives maybe in the London area, it's a bike lover, full stock, no more. Then obviously Amazon will not have uh, a fine grain or a, 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 a detail profiling, but we'll have a kind of uh, put the, the, still the user into categories. And then obviously the broader will be the category that the middleware decide to do and the better. And still obviously will deliver product or service. So this is a, 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 a mini, a, a bit what has been done, I think about two decades ago when we have number portability in the tele telecommunication industry. Uh, at that time, the phone number belonged to the telecom company. If you want to change a uh, telecommunication company, you got to change your mobile number. 
or I think also the fixed form number. Um, so here the idea is that the ownership of data uh, uh, should be split. It cannot be oh, everything in the hand of a digital platform. Something could be in the middleware and so on and so forth. Also, the GDPR will need uh, uh, to um, make explicit requirement for parties to develop some technical standard that, that could be used, uh, obviously, to, to, to do the audit that we'll talk in, uh, in a minute more in details. Okay. And uh, the, here, uh, uh, the, the, the challenge obviously is to set up this regulatory framework combining technical and uh, regulatory issue to uh, build the consumer trust in data separation and port data portability, avoiding making too much data too available. So talking about data processing audit, uh, well, we all know that um, big companies, I mean, if you want to be in the London Stock Exchange, uh, you need to provide a balance sheet in a specific, with a specific structure, and then somebody will scrutinize it. And this must be uh, certified, must be audited before. So something similar should be done for, with data audit and data process audit uh, that should assess uh, what they are doing with our data, okay? Uh, so obviously, uh, data audit and, and pro data process only will need a legal auditor and a technical auditor to assess that the data is manipulated and analyzed according to a specific set of rules, like you know the accounting principle to build the company balance sheet. We need to develop a set of uh, data processing rules to say you can do this and you cannot do that or whatever. Okay, so that, uh, uh, if the idea is to combine technically, technically regulatory um, um, features and orchestrating those two things, we should move from a situation like the one that we have today where there is a market dominance of some of these platforms that appear to be kind of self-regulated uh, apart from GDPR and tend to, 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 to form these ecosystems and actually, this could be black boxes, but uh, I found only carbon boxes. They, they, they look small. They give the idea that something is delivering something in your door. And uh, well, first of all, they cannot be really just self-regulated. We should be able to um, say that data that they collect must be separated. So they cannot collect whatever they want. And the fine-grained data must not be collected by these digital platforms, maybe only category uh, data will decide how big should be these categories. Um, this obviously um, will uh, um, if, uh, have uh, behind the idea of port data portability, obviously through some uh, open standard, a bit like for the open banking. And uh, this should open up uh, to new platform and new service provider, the, uh, the data, usage and uh, obviously we still need to have this data processing audit after all it's inconceivable that to collect our data we don't know exactly what they collect and what they they are doing with it um, in practice this is what happened when you have a, a problem with the authority it's very difficult to figure out what they do and how they collect this data actually there would be also space eh, if you trust let's say your government more than uh, these, these companies, uh, there could be also a space uh, uh, for uh, uh, introducing government digital ID like uh, uh, any government has in these days, also the European Union uh, has uh, uh, its own. Okay, so let me conclude saying that uh, uh, within the, uh, the dominance of digital platform that is now fully manifested, it's been around for uh, maybe a decade or so, but. Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg, that's my understanding. Um, for some reason, this plot will be considered a kind of an exceptional case uh, for doing uh, more or less whatever they want. Uh, but uh, maybe the, 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 the message I can give that regulatory on its own without a technical uh, component is difficult that would succeed. <clears throat> And also that this uh, element of data separation, data portability, and uh, uh, data processing audit is needed to assess what use they are doing of our data. 
Um, I leave you with the last uh, slide where there are some reference. I say that there is not a paper for this, uh, um, but maybe you would be interested to dig more. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Danilo. So uh, since we have a bit longer time for Q&A, there is a first Q&A question from Elena Kosakova, and uh, she asked that would we be less concerned about company with the same breadth and depth of consumer data? And would the difficulty here be about separating competition issue from consumer issue? Would you like to briefly comment on this? Yes. Uh, I think um, it would be the same difficulty when you, I believe you built a balance sheet to figure out uh, what is maybe capital expense, what is not. I believe there is a need to um, look uh, uh, inside these two elements. For instance, uh, here there is a lot of uh, behavior of user or final user. Uh, knowing when they access, uh, uh, um, I read a few papers written by a psychologist, uh, they figure out the profile of the user and the capacity to, the income capacity that they have, okay? So what is this? Is this a consumer piece of data or something else? Right, thanks very much for your response. Um, let's now go to our second speaker, Professor Jan Kramer from University of Paso. Uh, he's going to talk about big data and digital markets contestability, theory of harm and data access remedies. So the floor is yours. Yeah, welcome everyone. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, so you should be seeing my screen now. And actually what I'm saying or will be saying nicely builds up uh, on what uh, Danilo has said before. So um, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, maybe before I start, just one quick remark also from my side of the question that has just been raised, uh, which was, um, would we be concerned about the breadth and depth of the data as much if the firms didn't have the same market power? In my talk, I will argue largely that the market power comes precisely from the breadth and depth of the data that they process. So I don't think um, we can really disentangle the two. Um, now, in my talk, I'm very briefly going through a ton of material and some recent thinking we've done here and I've done here. Um, and uh, let me start out by sort of questioning a little bit what the role of regulation is and the purpose of regulation is and where the theory of harm lies in data-driven markets specifically. So uh, I'm here in this talk generally, I'm focusing on the role of data in all of this. There are different theories of harm relating to issues that are maybe driven more by network effects per se, but not data-driven network effects. So this is what I'm not touching upon. Uh, with respect to theories of harm, we can differentiate harms to competition and harms to innovation. And in harms to competition, there is, first of all, a lack of contestability um, in data-driven digital markets because of these so-called data-driven network effects. So particular network effects that come about with the role of data, the more users you have, the better you can uh, the more data you get, the better you can improve your algorithms, uh, the better service you get, the more users you get, and this virtuous cycle. Um, in this context also, there's a sort of risk of envelopment, incorporating features, uh, being able to um, scope up uh, because of the, of the data you get from consumers and their behavior to scope up sort of trends uh, earlier. Um, that also goes into the, the lack of contestability trying to supplant an incumbent in its, in its home market. Um, but more so, I'm actually concerned about the lack of contestability in new emerging markets. This is also something that Danilo has touched upon before, where um, incumbents tend to go from one market to another, and they can master these markets in a, in a better way or in an easier way because they have access to larger amounts of data. Uh, this has been termed the, the domino effect, and uh, there's also a risk of envelopment, of course, involved in this. And uh, this is, and I will come back to that, that is what I'm particularly concerned with. Uh, generally, we also have reduction in downstream competition. A lot of these firms are vertically integrated. They can self-preference, they can uh, exercise margin squeezes, 
uh, because they're also providing the input, also often input of data to firms operating. So for example, the data that an Amazon seller uh, gets fed back in, in the dashboard on, on sales is coming from Amazon, for example. And, um, and there's a potential distortion could be going on here as well. And that can also be a form of self-preferencing. Um, and finally, there is a data agglomeration and reinforcing of, of data dominance from so-called ancillary data services. This is also something I want to highlight specifically because I think um, it's, it's very important and a little underestimated in the debate today. It's also something that Danilo has briefly touched upon, uh, payment services, identification services. Those are all kinds of services where data is scooped up from markets and activities in which the firm is not directly involved in. So uh, by, by having an identification service, you can get information about websites and markets um, that you're not really competing and innovating in. So you're just agglomerating data here, and uh, which then reinforces the effects I've talked about before, especially also the kind of domino effect I've talked about before. And um, here also, I will come back to that point briefly, breaking up these uh, data-driven network effects in terms of line of business restriction potentially or even vertical separation I think has a different quality than the kind of vertical separation we talk about generally that you not, cannot operate on your own marketplace for example so this is something worthwhile thinking of and this is why I highlight this specifically now the harms to innovation are um, in similar fashion generally it's uh, if you have less competition or a lack of competition also makes you lazy and there's a lack of innovation a lot of times um, that comes along with this and this can also be this can also be shown theoretically of course this is a very contentious issue so less competitive pressure the problem of kill zones uh, which is probably still under research but on the way and uh, further monopolization towards integrated ecosystems where the large becoming larger and larger um, now all of this tends to harm innovation. You might argue, well, there's a lot of innovation going on in digital markets. Um, why should we be worried? Uh, isn't, isn't Facebook and Amazon, aren't they innovating uh, very much so? And the answer is yes, but maybe it could even be higher if there would be more competitive pressure. So this is the argument here in essence. Um, and we should not forget from all of this that there's also a lot of efficiencies from the integration and the aggregation of data, economies of scope, scope and scale, and um, that is something we should keep in mind when, when regulating as well. Now, this brings me to the very purpose of regulation in these kinds of markets, which, which I think should be the focus of policy interventions. And this is not so much contestability in the narrow sense, that means supplanting an incumbent in its very market that it has mastered. So. I don't think it should be about, for example, um, the next big search engine, uh, the next Google that does uh, that that provides a search engine. So what we what we should be worried about, I think, should be more protecting um, competition and in, in emerging markets, in new markets, uh, allowing niche entry and growth, allowing new companies to actually go on the market with new and fresh ideas to pull through, to sustain as an independent company. Uh, to be given access to data, for example, and um, then to grow to a sizable competitor uh, in another market, which then can exert some competitive pressure on the original um, incumbent, for, ex for example. So I think with all, with all that I'm saying now, this should be kept in mind. Now, in principle, there's two routes you could go down if you try to regulate these markets with respect to data remedies. One is trying to level the playing field by limiting data access of incumbents. So reducing or limiting what they can do, uh, reducing the collection of data in the first place or reducing the things they can do with the data. Proposals here are data siloing. So keeping data from different activities, user data, for example, from different activities in separate databases, separate accounts, not being to combine them and uh, or only being able to combine them based on user consent. I'm very skeptical that this is effective or even useful um, because it's reducing these very efficiencies I talked about before. Uh, you will probably very easily get consumer consent anyway. And um, it's also very difficult to enforce and to uh, monitor in the first place where the data has not been combined nevertheless. 
Uh, a second proposal is on data retention periods. So you could argue, well, data shouldn't be held so long. Um, you should only be able to hold them more, more shortly. Um, but that will actually, with, in the view of contestability in new and emerging markets, that will also reduce the number of data that you can share. And um, it will also um, probably hurt more sort of the, the, the um, smaller firms or emerging firms than the incumbent firms that already have a large stock of, of algorithmic learning, for example, that they've done in the past, and they can just learn incrementally on top of it. Prohibiting buying into defaults is a proposal that's been made also in the context, for example, by the, by the CMA in the online advertising market. Um, so it's a proposal where an incumbent firm shouldn't, should, so we're breaking these data network effects by not allowing uh, it to be the default search engine, for example, on Apple. Uh, Google being the default search engine on Apple. I'm also skeptical about that because the question is, what is the alternative? Um, choice screens have their own problems. Um, uh, and if you run an auction, Google is going to win it anyway. So I'm also skeptical about that. But there's uh, one proposal here I want to push forward is that uh, these auxiliary data services. So separating, not allowing, for example, Facebook to operate um, uh, a login service or a payment service, which then allows to draw in much more of this data. I think that can be done very well also by a separate entity. And um, it's running over well-defined interfaces already. And this is something we should probably leave to a trusted third party rather than what's one of these, one of these GAFA firms. Uh, so this is a proposal here I'm actually endorsing. Um, of all of these uh, on, the, on the left side and privacy enhancing technologies can also be something a move forward, but this is very something there's no one size fits all solution. So these have to be derived very, very carefully in very di in, in different uh, circumstances, very specifically. Um, for example, uh, some of these things have been addressed by Danilo as well, uh, how you can sort of separate um, data from profiles. And um, th that's something we can look into. But I'm, what I'm actually advocating is that we should share data because instead of breaking the data-driven network effects, we should be harnessing the non-rivalry of data so you can share it without having to give it up. And there's two routes you can go down here. And I think you should go down both because they have to work in concert. That is mandated bulk data sharing. So how can you share data of users, the breadth of data? And I'll come back to that in a second of users and uh, through a middleware, or I would call it a data trust, um, or uh, also uh, how can we ensure de-anonymization? So there are problems in the detail. And the second is user-initiated data portability, because this allows you to share deep data about a cons certain consumer in a privacy preserving, or at least in a um, data protection uh, conform way. Now, why do we need both depth and breadth of data? It's because um, actually, you need both deep and, and, and broad data to be able to run a successful data-driven service. So in a lot of these applications, uh, for example, predictions, recommendations you're making, you have both data from a number of users and data about a certain user, a certain number of features of, about a certain user. So if you have a metrics like that, it's usually in, in uh, normal applications, it's uh, very sparsely populated. So you have very few entries. So a consumer, you know something, for example, if you think about the, the, the features as the products that consumers have bought or the search strings that users have entered uh, in a search engine and the number of users, it's usually very, very sparsely populated because every user just has a tiny fraction of the products bought. And now the sparsity of this matrix makes it so difficult to make predictions, not for common items. That is something almost everyone can do for common features. So blockbuster movies recommendations, you know, that's easy. What's difficult is predictions and um, discovery of rare and new items. And that is sort of where the quality differentiates, the data-driven quality differentiates. And for that, you need access to sort of broad and deep data. And for that, you need both bulk data sharing as well as data portability, which allows you to do both the broad and the deep kind of user sharing. Now, what are some of the trade-offs involved in this? And we could uh, discuss on this uh, for a long time. I'm just highlighting here the, the, the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, I think with broad data sharing, there's two main trade-offs. One is protecting legitimate business incentives. 
of collecting the data and running sort of a data-driven service in the first place and promoting competition on the other hand. So um, that brings me to a distinction of data that's being collected as a byproduct versus data that's being sort of the main product of the service that you're running. So for me, it's a difference, for example, if you're, uh, and, and th there's a thin line to differentiate the two. Sometimes it's very clear, sometimes it's not. So you can say click and, uh, click and query search data is something you're just obtaining from uh, being sort of the dominant search engine and that should be shared. Uh, but how about reviews, for example? Maybe if you're Amazon, reviews are something that is not coming as a byproduct because you're making a lot of sales, people are recommending items. But maybe if you're um, like a TripAdvisor site where uh, you're, you're uh, recommending hotels um, and restaurants and reviews are the main product of your service, then that is something else. Uh, you should also take into account whether there are viable commercial data offers already. So if you get, ac get access to the data as an entrant or not, that all should be taken into account. Um, and the second main trade-off is with respect to privacy and the usefulness of the data set for algorithmic learning. So if you anonymize too much, it's not as useful. If you anonymize too little, then you, of course, you have a privacy issue. And uh, here, I think we need to go ahead with um, both legal and technical measures. So on the one hand, it's not a catch-all argument that privacy cannot be preserved. The, there's tremendous advancements, uh, both in computational power as well as also in privacy preserving techniques. And, uh, and yes, you might argue there um, still is a lot of papers that show that de-anonymization de is possible, but they sometimes make the impression that de-anonymization just happens as sort of a byproduct of getting access to the data. That's not the case. You actually have to exert a lot of effort to de-anonymize the data. And um, you could just plainly make that illegal um, and at least uh, reduce sort of the, the uh, incentives maybe to do so. Uh, data trusts or introducing a middleware or data sandboxing, bringing your algorithm to the data are also um, things that can be used. Uh, and I think no one of them really is the panacea. So we really have to think about these um, as a, on a case by case basis and um, very carefully. So principles for mandated data sharing in a nutshell are only share raw user data observed and volunteered, but not inferred data. Only data that was created as a byproduct to preserve these innovation incentives. Of course, in a secure and sufficiently anonymized way, and it reads more easily on the slide than it is in practice. And what's really important, that data sharing needs to be done in real time and through and continuously. So it's not a one-off type of thing. And um, that uh, we can facilitate through APIs, for example. Now, the next step would be to share deep user data, which you cannot do because of the anonymization necessary with bulk data sharing. So data portability in a nutshell means a user gives consent and then the data can be shared by the content service provider that currently holds onto the data, either to another content service provider directly or to the user in a personal data store, be it on the computer or on the cloud, or something which can also be deemed a middleware in a sense, a personal information management system. So this essentially is software that sort of um, manages consent and, and the data flows for you and can also collect the data, can also integrate a personal data store, for example, and can act very much so as a middleware as Danilo has been pointing it out. And um, so, and it can also act as a data broker if you want, I'm, I'm, you know, there's, an, Topic for another talk where I'm skeptical whether this is actually is economically viable. So data broker selling your data on your behalf, you're, you're participating from the value of your data. Also here, we would need to differentiate between provided, observed, inferred data. And also here, the recommendation would be only provided and observed data should be within the scope. And um, also here, we can have a discussion about what that portability means. What is the scope of data? What is the scale of data? How, how much data you get in terms of provided and observed? Is click data on advertisements, for example, included or not? Um, how timely is the data? And how frequent do you have access to it? And in short, here also I'm advocating for a continuous real-time data access because data portability as we currently have it under GDPR is actually very ineffective because um, it's just too slow and um, it's not continuous in, in, in real time. Um, so this brings me to sort of the principles for data portability 2.0 as I've coined it here. 
Uh, again, only raw data should be shared. Uh, it requires also a finer consent management of consumers than we currently have it on a more fine granular level. Uh, because uh, we also need to address, for example, rights of others. So what is if a chat protocol is ported and it only partially contains my data and also data of someone else, then we also need consents on who can, um, you know, do I allow others to port that kind of data as well? Um, that also have been, been brought up as an argument why data sharing should, data portability should, should pose more problems than it solves. I disagree with that. I think we can fix through, through more finer con consent management and um, also extortion of consent and things like that should, should not be, um, um, should be taken seriously. And um, it also needs to be an open secure standards. Danilo has touched upon that as well. And I think for that, we really need more personal information management systems or so a technical middleware if you want. And we also need um, independent identification services um, for that. And uh, we should not rely on the, the GAFAS identification services for that as well. And both are issues where regulators could also step in and facilitate that very much so. Now, this brings me to my last slide, and then I'll conclude um, that what is the future of, of the regulation of the digital markets? What should it look like? I think there is a role for more consumer engagement um, in the sense that uh, consumers need to take more their rights into their hands. And uh, for regulators, you can facilitate data portability, for example, but then of course there is a certain obligation to participate also of, of consumers and actually exercising their rights. But for that, we need to make it as simple as possible to exercise the rights. And that can be achieved by standards and um, also these personal information management systems. A lot of the things that I've said today and proposed are also actually part of the debate on the Digital Markets Act and uh, also um, in the UK or the Digital Markets Unit. Um, but um, I'm skeptical about some of the things and we can discuss about that. So data siloing by default, for example, which is an Article 5a, I raised some skepticism about the effectiveness of that. Um, I um, encourage or you know, think it's a, it's a good step forward to have continuous real-time data portability, not only for consumers, but also for businesses on the platform. And there's also provision on bulk data sharing, but this is limited to search data, both on the sending end and the receiving end. So only other search engines can get access to that data. I think that should be an obligation more widely considered, although I think search is a good starting point for that. So. To conclude, the DMA, I think, is roughly right. Regulation, more data-driven regulation or data access regulation is needed. And um, I'm happy to go in the discussion with that. And um, for the time being, I'll leave some hints for, for readings um, open. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. That's a very interesting presentation. And I have collected two questions for you. One in the Q&A. It's from Irvin Haag. So if I understand him correctly, he's asking, uh, so platforms are actually selling um, for, for ages, for a very long time. Why would it become a competition concern now? Uh, and then another question is from Paul Hydews. It's a bit about what makes date. Why do we treat data markets differently? So, so Paul, do you want to come in? It's a very long question. It might be a good idea. <laughs> Sorry, I, I guess I cheated because it had two elements. But I, I was wondering on the data. You you focused a lot on consent of of, of passing on the data, and so you know with data we have externalities. And so in economics, normally we don't think personal choice is the answer when there's strong externalities. You know, my data doesn't help a firm unless she has data of others to learn from that. And so there's a big externality element. And so I'm, I'm surprised that you focus so much on individual choice on passing on the data because you decide for me what the firm knows about me in a sense. Yeah, let me, let me maybe take that question on directly uh, first. So um, yes, there's a lot of externality in data. Um, this is also what I've, what I've uh, alluded to. Um, at the same time, we have uh, privacy protection um, here uh, that we need to take care of. So we cannot just share, you know, we cannot just share, share the data for everyone and, um, and uh, that would not work. So this is the element where I brought in, you need to share, you need to have both broad and deep data that needs to be shared. 
And um, in order to square the circle, because you cannot just do bulk data sharing at a level that is useful for algorithmic learning while protecting personal privacy. And at the other time, you cannot just focus on data portability as, as user initiated data sharing, because only a small fraction of the users will actually share that kind of data. And um, then you don't have the broad data set. You actually need access to both. And to square the circle, I think we need to focus in the policy interventions also on both. And then um, there, there will be usefulness in the data because of the metrics I've pointed out, the sparsely populated max, they actually have both dimensions that can be shared and can be put together by third parties. Um, now, relating to the, um, to the other question um, on, um, is Amazon just a reseller as everyone else has been before? And why should we worry? I mean, that's my short read of the question, maybe. And um, well, I mean, I, I alluded to the, the, the point of the role of data. And I think a lot of people will agree with me on that, that it is not only a different scale of operation that we should worry about, but also at the different quality of operation because of all the data intensive processes that are in there. And um, for example, Amazon can actually uh, more closely monitor what kind of, what was the search process? What was the consumer journey that I went through before buying a product, which would not have been so possible in a some large retail store, store before, or um, they um, have access to, uh, as Danilo has also pointed out, these large ecosystems become aggregators themselves uh, through Alexas and stuff like this. So I think there's just a different scale and, uh, and, and scope, so also different quality um, of the operations. And this is why uh, regulation is warranted, among other things. Um, Right, so thanks very much for your comments. I noticed that there are a few more questions in the chat box, but we will come to that in the Q&A question. Uh, but let's go move on to our third speaker, Professor Fiona Scott Morton from Yale University. She'll talk about why digital platform user protection regulation increase competition. So the floor is yours, Fiona. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, everybody for the invitation. Um, today, as uh, Wynne just said, I'll talk about whether antitrust and regulation are substitutes or complements. I want to uh, first acknowledge that all the graphics in this presentation are due to the brilliant Amelia Fletcher, uh, your own faculty member. I'm pretty terrible at that kind of thing, so I, I borrowed hers. So many thanks for that. Uh, let's see if I can make this go forward. Okay. Um, the increased focus on competition and the increased focus on, I think, consumer protection and competition together in the digital platform context is very topical. Um, there's not as much as I would like about the combination uh, of these two in the debate and in the academic literature. My own thinking on this has developed uh, really strongly with the help of others, uh, including Amelia. And I would refer you all to a working paper, a, a discussion paper that's posted at the Yale University Tobin Center that discusses consumer protection in the online context. Okay, um, so as I said, antitrust and competition law is really of great social interest today. It's in the news regularly. Uh, regulation is also part of the field of economics. And it was important back in the days when we regulated airlines and telephones and natural gas and so forth. In the US, we had this wave of deregulation and that wave of deregulation really um, reduced interest in the field. And uh, I, I think by PhD students and family members. And so that the amount of teaching of regulatory economics just decreased a lot. And the amount of research decreased a lot, and we're really missing a strong new generation of regulation economists, which is too bad. Uh, it's particularly too bad because we're about to have to um, regulate digital platforms, and that might be the biggest policy challenge for industrial organization economists for the next 20 years, I would think. So it would really be a good time to have a lot of research and policy expertise to draw on in the area of regulation and particularly regulation of digital stuff. And we don't have that. Uh, so I think that's a real challenge for the field. And I would encourage 
graduate students listening and anybody training graduate students to direct them this way because I don't think anybody will wonder what is the relevance of their research topic or they'll uh, or they will ever run out of questions to, to think about. Now what's the conceptual difference between antitrust and regulation? I find that reporters and the media in general think of these as the same thing. They think, oh, we're just controlling corporate power. But they're not the same thing, of course, once you think about the way it works. Antitrust is a general law. It applies to all industries. It's got this prohibition against anti-competitive conduct, and it's got ex post enforcement. First, the corporation does something that we think might be anti-competitive, and then enforcers go out and uh, investigate that and possibly prove it. And then there's some remedy after the fact. Regulation, by contrast, involves a regulator or Congress. Congress makes a general law for a sector. Regulators specify exactly what that means. That regulator often has sectoral expertise. They know something about telecommunications or whatever it might be. And therefore the enforcement and the, and the rules are kind of ex ante, the rules are upfront and immediately that corporation steps out of line, the regulator can uh, explain that and bring them back into line. And this often includes not just competition enforcement, but consumer protection because the Congress or the parliament can give the regulator any goals it wants. It might be something about the public interest or serving people in rural areas or, uh, any, anything, any goal that, uh, that is of interest. Okay, so what's happening in consumer protection today? You can see the first excellent Amelia Fletcher uh, graphic. What's really, I think, uh, fun about consumer protection today is that we have a mixture of behavioral economics and digital markets. And this is new. We've had digital markets uh, for a few decades. We've had behavioral economics for a few decades, and we need to put them together in a very serious way. Now, uh, the flippant side of me says, finally, a good use for behavioral economics. Instead of just understanding why it is that we all don't go to the gym, um, now we can do something with it. So why uh, does this matter so much? Well, the platform is controlling the choice architecture that we see online. The platform is engaging in relentless A-B testing to determine what works. And by works, I mean what we'll click on or buy or respond to. The platform has an incredible trove of personal current data with which it can interact its uh, research and findings. Um, and the platform has a very strong profit motive to get us to stay online and watch ads or to buy things. And in the United States, there are almost no rules. This is not true in the UK, happily, or the EU. So the platform is optimizing against the behavioral consumer and extracting surplus, exploiting that consumer in a way that strongly impacts the distribution of surplus. Okay, what are a few specifics that we need to worry about? The consumer doesn't really know who she's buying from online. Um, I mean, maybe you've got a well-known brand, but a lot of times you do not have a well-known brand. And so the lack of direct physical interaction the way you would have in a store increases the need for some basic rules about contact details and how do you return things and how do you complain. Also, we are often experiencing uh, free services that are bartered in return for attention and data. And sometimes we actually have a legal gap where our existing consumer protection laws don't cover things that are quote free, unquote. We also have a problem that reviews and rankings really strongly influence what consumers do. So we've got, uh, uh, how do I choose a hotel in a faraway place? I go and I look at the reviews. Uh, maybe I follow a social influencer on Twitter and I learn about a product in that place. This is a new way of learning about quality and it's different from offline and all sorts of bad stuff happens here. Like reviews are selectively displayed, uh, websites might pay users to pr pr uh, post a good review, their uh, website might buy fake reviews, uh, social influencers might be being paid to promote a product and not tell their followers that that's the case. Uh, the rankings in a Expedia hotel listing might be because the Expedia thinks the hotel is good, but it might be that the hotel has paid to be at the top of that ranking. So in general, there's a lot of problems with the way this works. There are also um, 
dark patterns that hurt consumers. What, what are dark patterns? It's when the platform designs online choice architecture in the interest of itself for its own uh, profits or, or sales, and, and that deviates from the interest of consumers. How can this happen? Well, consumers have a lot of behavioral biases. In particular, they are very responsive to defaults and they're very responsive to framing of choices. So defaults can cause us to buy things because there's a button that's pre-ticked when we arrive at a page that, that says, yes, I want this magazine, or yes, I want insurance, or yes, I would like to be uh, uh, signed up for this repeat sales program. Framing, uh, gives us, I'm sorry, this isn't quite all showing, but gives us uh, problems like drip pricing when you buy tickets and you get to the end and there's a fee and then maybe another fee. Um, misleading references telling us that something's on sale when nobody ever bought at the original price. Messages that tell us there are only three hotel rooms left and we don't really know what that means. And unfair terms, and I'll give you some examples of these. Um, so here's a default ranking. Normally we go to the top. Uh, this is well known from the Google Shopping case and other, and other fora. You go right to the top of the rankings. And that means that whatever algorithm is generating that ranking is very impactful in terms of sales. So we have uh, some existing research and there's, there's more of different in different contexts here, but rankings really impact consumer choice and therefore a hotel that wants to be chosen more often has a strong financial incentive to pay to get to the top of the list. Uh, a search engine that's interested in making profit has a strong incentive to accept uh, compensation to give prominence to those corporations that are willing to pay for those sellers that are willing to pay for. Um, it, there are many ways to disguise these monetization points. Um, again, this is uh, Amelia's graphic, and here you see the preferred partner property and the promoted uh, little rectangle. And these are very small things on this page. And what they are officially doing is telling the consumer that the property is paying to be higher up in the list. But it's pretty difficult to figure that out. And certainly the small gray text is not going to be the thing that you notice as much as the large blue text or the bright yellow text. So it's, it, this is confusing to consumers and hiding what's actually happening in the rankings. Um, I think this is a terrific example. The April Fool's Day prank where uh, within five working days of written notification, you have to surrender your immortal soul. Um, this seems like something that most of us would just tick right past because who reads the terms and conditions? They're many pages long, they're written for lawyers. And if you read them all, you would have no time to do anything else. So this is again, not a useful thing for consumers. It's not clear, it's not easy to understand. Um, I mentioned signing up for repeat purchases. This happens all the time. Uh, it happens on Amazon. There's in the United States, there's a pre-ticked box that says you want to subscribe to this and receive it every month. And you have to actively get out of that and say, no, actually, I'd just like to buy it one time. Here, the price is really quite dramatic. The, the $4.95 today, but $84 every month if you don't cancel. So this is the type of thing that is not helping consumers uh, choose well. Um, and we have, again, empirical ac uh, academic evidence that consumers fold for these hidden terms. Nobody reads contracts, obviously. Uh, and we uh, have long known that disclosing things like we do in contracts with about immortal souls or anything else really doesn't help uh, because people don't read them and they also have trouble understanding them. Consumers also have incorrect interpretations of contract terms because they're too optimistic. They overweight the probability of small, uh, small probability events and underweight the probability of large probability events. So they get the, the analysis wrong, even if you do tell them what's happening. Framing effects here uh, in this, uh, again, marvelous uh, screenshot are just everywhere. Um, 
45% off today, time remaining one day, book three times, only run room left. All of this is trying to push the user into feeling a sense of urgency and booking the property and thinking the property is on sale and thinking that it has been chosen by the website to be at the top when none of these things need necessarily be true. This is not uh, acceptable behavior any longer in the United Kingdom, but this is what websites look like in the United States. Subscriptions are a big problem. I mentioned them briefly before um, my experience on Amazon, but the prevalence of, of subscriptions online is substantial and there's the danger of auto enrollment. There's the switching cost to get out. There are barriers to cancellation. We need a lot more uh, rules about the way subscriptions are handled online to protect consumers. Price, minimum contract period, purchase obligations need to be clearly stated. Firms uh, need to tell consumers when something changes and allow them to opt out when that happens. And uh, automatic auto renewals are, of course, very dangerous. You want the consumer to have to actively uh, consent to auto renewals. Um, I went to the UK for Christmas this year, which was an adventure due to the coronavirus, but we managed it. And um, so I enrolled in Amazon Prime over the holiday and then canceled it at the end of our time in the UK. And canceling was really difficult. It took about 16 clicks to cancel, um, whereas it took about one to sign up. So you want those experiences to be more symmetric and certainly in the same medium, no clicking to join online, but needing to write a paper letter to cancel. Uh, something else that's very important about the difference between digital and online is that it seems that digital is, not surprisingly, uh, as everything seems to do this, but it's exacerbating socioeconomic divisions in the United States. Vulnerable customers are, are even more vulnerable to exploitation online. Um, artificial intelligence discrimination is super simple to execute. Uh, you give the, the machine a goal, like getting more people to click, and that machine can locate and exploit an even wider set of vulnerabilities than might be possible offline, where you might be limited to geography or something about uh, the, the nature of the product. Here, uh, a machine can take everything they know about you, uh, demographic-wise, what you bought last week, last year, yesterday, a minute ago, your cursor movements, uh, and, and try to divine your emotional state, as well as what kind of person you are. And we have protected classes in the United States, like gender and race and so on. But these are don't cover enough of the problem. Now we probably need uh, to protect classes that are too numerous to list. Risk averse people, optimistic people, gamblers, people who are hungry. Uh, and so I think we, um, we, we run the risk that if we don't regulate uh, for uh, algorithmic based discrimination and outcomes, we're going to create more problems. And in the United States right now, there's great social and policy attention on systemic racism. We're trying to eradicate old forms of this racism. And I think it's really important not to invite in new forms of this racism. It's also um, part of our attention to systemic racism has revealed that there's a lot of important aspects of life that are being affected today by AI. And that goes to, stuff as wide as qualifying for bail to get out of jail, whether you're permitted to, to um, pay to get out of jail, credit scores, uh, which uh, determine how much you can borrow, job interviews, are you gonna uh, get past the first stage and be offered a job? Lots of these things are now being attacked with AI and we're going to end up creating a lot more problems uh, if we don't start uh, regulating here in a sensible way. So digital platform regulation is moving. Um, in, the, in Europe and in the UK, there's existing EU law um, and there's forthcoming EU law, the Digital Service Act, platform to business, uh, new, new version of the platform to business regulation. In the United States, there is nothing on consumer protection. There is one state, California, that has done something about this, but at the federal level, we have nothing. On operations, on the other hand, entry, data sharing, and so on, we have the Digital Markets Act in the EU, and we have the just a uh, few days ago, 
uh, five new, uh, six now, I think, new bills in, introduced in the House of Representatives that would uh, regulate some behavior of digital platforms in the form of interoperability, data portability, tying, bundling, uh, whether a platform is allowed to own a business that runs on top of it, whether a platform can discriminate against the business that runs on top of it, and so forth. Now, the second part of this talk is the antitrust. And what is fun about this is that we have the same graph we had before, or figure that we had before. That is to say, behavioral economics and digital markets. It's just that those are also shaking up antitrust. Um, antitrust is, is actually exciting uh, right now in the United States in, in 2020. Uh, and actually in 2021 also, we had tremendous movement in the United States on the antitrust front. Um, Europe, as you can see on, on this page, has been enforcing against Google in particular for a long time. But in the United States, Department of Justice and states brought uh, three Google cases last year. Um, the uh, Federal Trade Commission brought a case against Facebook last year. And then in 2021, we have the Epic case uh, and we also have a case, uh, which is a, a private case against Apple and uh, with the Washington DC state attorney, well, the Washington DC district attorney general brought a, an MFN case against Amazon. So just all of a sudden movement when there had been none in the previous 10 years. I think the most important of these in red are the federal government cases against uh, Google and Facebook. Now, what do these uh, cases allege? They actually have some behavioral economics in them. And I think this might be partly why it took so long to get here, because behavioral has not historically played a large role in antitrust enforcement, at least in the United States. And we need to start doing a better job on that front. So the Google search um, contracts, sorry, the Google search cases uh, emphasize that defaults matter. Competition is not a click away that framing matters, uh, foreclosure of nascent rivals and steering, it can be done with framing. Uh, the Google ad tech monopolization has less behavioral in it. It's more about acquisitions and disrupting multi-homing. Uh, these raise take rates, the price of the platform and cause harms uh, that you all know about, higher prices, quality, innovation, et cetera. Um, the allegations in Facebook are uh, acquisition of nascent and potential rivals and buy or bury uh, those, those nascent or potential rivals. Consumers here can't see many of the terms of trade. They can't move their business because they don't see that there's uh, a monopsony issue. They're being paid too little for the attention that they supply to the platform. They may not realize that the, the social media that they're consuming is addictive and actually not increasing their consumer welfare. Advertisers don't have the data that they need to analyze what's going on in terms of the terms of trade. Uh, they may be actually um, receiving fraudulent uh, ads and, and fraudulent uh, uh, behavior by Facebook. So again, the advertiser side pays higher prices, consumers suffer lower quality, less innovation. Okay, the Digital Markets Act is interesting here because it is officially not competition law, but it is clearly designed to have an impact on competition or contestability, which is going to reduce profits and increase consumer surplus if, it, if it's done right. The DMA is also clearly designed to increase fairness, which can be done with two instruments, competition and consumer protection. Why two instruments? Well, competition is going to reduce platform profits and increase consumer surplus, and that's going to be more fair, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and this the DMA is therefore kind of an intermediate function. It's not pure competition law, nor is it traditional consumer protection. Uh, the DMA could add some of the rules that the previous two speakers talked about in terms of intermediaries and some more um, beefing up of portability and interoperability, exactly because I think it serves this very nice intermediate function between competition law and consumer protection. Now, why? Uh, why does the DMA actually intersect with consumer protection? Because it has this interesting new way of thinking about fairness. The marginal contribution of an individual user in a market with network effects is very low. The individual consumer has a poor outside option if they leave the platform because the consumer wants to be with everybody else. Okay. 
So in that context, the platform keeps all the surplus because the individual consumer has no bargaining power. But since the main gain that consumers get from the platform is by being together, if they all could leave together, then they would have enormous bargaining power because the platform would have nothing left and they could go to an alternative platform that might be better even. Um, so the platform's outside option is very poor if all the consumers leave together. And so when you think about the, that bargaining game, the, the payoff to consumers is much higher. So we, when we think about average contribution of consumers is much higher than marginal contribution. And there's a role for regulation to try to push the surplus split more in this direction, closer to average, to recognize the contribution of all parties and reward it accordingly. A traditional interpretation of fairness isn't that one. It's the more standard consumer protection rules like no fraud, no deception, make the framing of the online experience be neutral so that it mimics consumer choices without distortions. And these changes will move markets closer to a perfectly competitive benchmark. Enforcing those consumer protection rules will allow consumers to make good choices, have correct information and beliefs, be secure in their ability to experiment, and that's gonna cause consumers to move their business to a better product because they can tell what the better product is and they're not afraid uh, to move to it. So let's go back to my original question. At the moment we have leading edge advances in digital consumer protection in both the EU and the UK, and a new strategy to create more digital competition in the EU. There's a lot of action in antitrust enforcement in the US, but almost no protect, consumer protection movement in the US. And that's too bad because I think consumer protection fosters competitive markets. If you're gonna bother doing antitrust enforcement, you also want to have consumer protection moving as well because they work together. Increased search and switching increases competition. That reduces market power. Greater consumer confidence that they're able to make choices and see what quality is and be protected means they can experiment with new products and new sellers. That encourages entry. Neutral consumer choice architecture requires firms to compete on the merits rather than tricking consumers into buying something that they really didn't want. Consumer protection protects firms that are following the rules from unfair competition by firms that are trying to trick consumers and prevents competition from giving us a race to the bottom. So any given level of competition will be more effective in creating consumer surplus if the market has good consumer protection in it. So I think consumer protection and, and competition are complements. And therefore, when we think about the policies in this space, digital platforms, we should try to move these together because I think that will really increase their impact. And uh, that's it from me. I'll stop sharing and we can have a discussion. Thanks very much, Fiona. So I've collected uh, two questions for you. One, it's from Oren Baju. Uh, so very general question. He would like you to comment on the distinction between antitrust and regulation. And the second question, it's from myself. So uh, I wonder how we could protect consumers if they simply don't engage. Because as we've seen in Paul's presentation yesterday, consumers may just procrastinate uh, when you nudge them to switch. Yes, well, let me take the, the second one first, because luckily, Paul is also one of the authors on the paper that I mentioned at the Tobin Center. And so I have answered this question a number of times, um, or heard Paul answer it. Um, and the uh, I think, and Paul can speak up if I get this wrong, but I think what our view is, is that consumers very often do not engage. Therefore, you need regulation to protect those consumers. And you need to have defaults that are set up to protect the consumer that is not going to engage. So everything about the regulation that you do in this space, I think has to be under the assumption that a large fraction of consumers are going to do nothing. And that whatever the regulator chooses will be the thing that happens to them. And that puts a big premium on getting the defaults right, essentially and doing re whatever redistribution you wanna do um, if we think that consumers are not gonna actively take choices to do that for themselves. Paul, did you want to amend that? Uh, 
No, so, you always do this better than me. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me quickly go to, I will dispute that, but let me quickly go to uh, the antitrust versus regulation. So Fiona, remember- I'm sorry, Fiona, can I elaborate on my question just a little bit yeah. because it was just a, a teaser. So I was, I was going to ask you, so first of all, thank you for the great presentation, but my question has to do with the distinction that you draw between consumer protection regulation and antitrust. And at the end, you say that these are complements, and that's, of course, great and important, but I'm wondering about the two dimensions of distinction that you drew at the beginning. So if I understood you correctly, it was like a two by two, it's like ex ante versus ex post, and then market specific sector regulation versus general for the antitrust. And I'm, I'm not sure that that's always true. So if you're thinking about antitrust, you have um, you know, pre-clearance of mergers, for example, that would be antitrust that happens ex ante. If you think about um, consumer protection, the FTC Act, unfair and deceptive kind of practices is consumer protection that happens ex post. So I'm wondering whether these distinctions really hold in trying to kind of distinguish these two bodies and maybe even more so, it's clear that for lawyers, you know, they want to distinguish the two bodies where they are uh, expert, but for economists, why does this matter to distinguish consumer protection from regulation of consumer protection versus antitrust? Um, so of course you're right, every country does this differently. Um, some blend these functions together much more than others. And there are, you can write an antitrust law that's just for a specific sector. You can give a regulatory agency a competition mandate and nothing else. So there's infinite varieties of this. And I was trying to give a, what's a pretty general uh, description that works at a high level in lots of places, which is competition law swings in after the fact and says, Google, you should not have run shopping this way. Or Microsoft, you should not have treated the browser this way. Whereas if you look at regulation for telecommunications, for example, at least in the United States, the FCC is just continually uh, regulating what happens to internet in schools and what happens to the uh, interconnection rules between the local loop and the long distance loop and things like that. So the regulator is often sectoral, has sectoral expertise because you're deep in the weeds is often given a mandate from the government that isn't just competition, but is something like schools or rural people or whatever it might be, media plurality. Uh, and the regulator is making a lot of small rules to make sure that firms don't go off the rails up front. And antitrust doesn't work with competition comes after the fact. Uh, although you're right that mergers, we have a prospective merger review because it's quite hard to do that after the fact, but still when we, uh, go to block a firm from merging, we're in court, block, their transactions underway. And at least in the United States, we're trying to block it at that point. It's not like uh, nothing happens and a firm's coming to say, well, we're thinking about merging with A, B, C, or D, which one would you like best? That's not how it works. Um, so why is this important for economists? Um, it's important for economists because now we're getting into uh, rule regulations like the DMA. 18 rules telling platforms up front what they can't do. And we need to understand what the impacts of those rules are going to be on prices, quality, entry, uh, investment, innovation, because we'd like to protect consumers and increase innovation and uh, restore some balance between the users, business users and end users of the platform and the platform. And that's quite hard to do, of course. And so the way we write these regulations really matters. And so I, I, that's why I think economists should be studying them more. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, thank you very much. And just to be clear, I didn't say that economists should, be in, should not be interested in regulation. My question is, why does it matter for the economists when I study a certain regulation, whether I call it consumer protection or antitrust? It seems like these kind of lawyers' labels. For economists, it matters if it's ex ante or ex post, if it's sector specific or general. These basic criteria that you mentioned. I don't think the labels are to matter for economists. I definitely agree that economists should be studying I, I would disagree. I think they do because in our business, we're, we, we categorize things. We put them in buckets to help us understand conceptually what they're doing. So for example, a lot of consumer protection leans very heavily on our knowledge of behavioral economics. 
a lot of competition uh, enforcement leans very heavily on our knowledge of industrial organization and how firms compete. There's really, uh, uh, no, and I'm, what I'm trying to emphasize is that there's an overlap, which is really exciting and fun. I'd like people to recognize that and study it more. But these, uh, these um, legal traditions come from different economic foundations. Okay, thanks very much for all the questions and comments. Let's now um, go to look at the Q&A and chat boxes. There are quite a number of questions and I will just summarize them a little bit and see if the panelists want to take uh, any of them. So the first one from uh, Ibru Gok, he's asking whether regulation like DMA is sufficient to address platforms market power. Um, another one, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Cameron Mercado, he's asking uh, whether, uh, Fiona, you could comment a bit more on the concept of fairness. Um, and okay. then, um, so, so, sorry, Fiona, j just to pull, summarize all the questions. And the third one from Elias, he's asking whether user protection always go in, in the same, uh, increases competition. Maybe sometimes there are a bit of conflict between the two. Uh, then in the chat box, we have some question for Danilo's presentation, uh, precisely from Bob Sutton and also Emily, Emilia, asking about the, could you clarify the role of middleware agent and what is the role of the value of data? Okay, so um, Fiona, you would like to go first? Sure. Um, it Will regulation like the DMA be sufficient to address platforms market power? I think that's a you know million dollar question, trillion dollar question. Uh, we don't know. Um, and I think uh, as much work and study and uh, analysis as economists can provide into that uh, question is really, really worthwhile. Um, and then just quickly, um, the, for more depth on the new definition of fairness, we have uh, the same group that's been writing these papers for the Tobin Center has a paper that will come out, I think in a few days um, about exactly this topic. So I would just refer you to that for more, uh, more detail. And then last, um, digital platform user protection, are, is there a conflict? Um, the studies of the GDPR, I, I think the GDPR um, is not perhaps the gold standard of privacy regulation because it was not designed to be pro-competitive nor with a sufficient attention to the behavioral economics literature. People just keep clicking yes if they're on their way to a website and the website says click here if you want to use this website. So we get click happy and Privacy regulations can be designed to be pro-competitive or they can be agnostic to competition. And I think it, the statement that uh, was released in the UK a few weeks ago between the, the privacy people, the information people and the, and the CMA was marvelous in the way it addressed this uh, interplay between the two and said, no, we don't view them as being in conflict. We view them as being complementary and working together and we're going to try to pick privacy regulations that are pro-competitive and get a competition regime that respects privacy where privacy is something that consumers can value and choose in the marketplace. So that that's the that would be my quick answer. Okay, thanks very much. Would Danilo like to respond to the questions? Uh, could, yes. could, I, could I explain what the, the question was because uh, the, the point I was, I was wanting to get at, which came up in, in all three of the, the talks, is the idea of data being valuable. And it's not sort of privacy, it's the fact that you, you as a, a computer user, you own, you own this, this data, uh, in a sense. You're, you're, and the bit, it's, I think it's not quite what, I mean, Fiona was saying there's a, there's a difference between average and marginal value. But even without that, that the fact is that you are possessing something which is worth a very, very tiny amount to anybody who, who takes it. On the other hand, every day you, you're, giving, you're giving away free lots of things that are worth a very, very tiny amount. 
And it feels to me as though that looks like the sort of situation where you'd expect to find like a buyer, a seller's cooperative uh, or a, an organization which uh, offers to intervene. You sign up to the organization, it pays you to sign up, and then it operates these buttons that say, you know, uh, do, you, do you want to give your data away? Do you want, instead of, instead of you just clicking these things, I think I'll let them have it, it would, you'd say, well, I would, I would, I will only allow you to have this data if you pay for it. And the, if a big enough firm has got a lot of subscribers, it seems to me that they ought to be owning something that's quite valuable. That they could then sell on to uh, the, the people who want data. And there would be some way in which the people could get value for it. So it seems as though rather than thinking as being protecting privacy, it seems more like a kind of equivalent trade unionism, really, of kind of trying to uh, collective bargaining over something that is valuable that's being taken for very, at a very low price. Um, uh, yes, Bob, uh, I, I will try to actually uh, give also a link of a paper in case uh, you are interested in. Uh, it's surprising me that uh, our people in the database area that are studying those things. So there is a, a paper that is a theoretical paper on pricing private data that I'm touching here, uh, the title and the link. Uh, so if you want, you can uh, go into more details. So this paper essentially said that there is a, a way to give price to private data. Private data could be my age or my sex or what kind of work uh, I'm doing or my income bracket or if I am healthy or not healthy and so on. So this general paper that actually uh, is quite old, I could say, at least for computer science standard, goes back to 2014, um, um, is a general uh, theory for pricing private data uh, based on market theory. Um, but the point is always this, uh, that uh, uh, we don't recognize these uh, tiny small transactions that we make uh, once we release a bit of data about ourselves. Um, because obviously maybe today I do something that allow to infer my age from, from the language that I use. And now there are very good algorithms uh, that work on social networks that try to uh, spot your age with an accuracy that is about 93, 95%. Obviously not the exact age, you are 20 or you are 55, but obviously they put you in a small cohort. You are a teenager or uh, you are, uh, let's say, um, a, a, an adult or you are a pensioner and so on and so forth. This will allow also me to answer, I believe, to the Emilia a question about uh, fine-grained classification and coarse-grained classification for data. Uh, she was referring, I think, in the question to Spotify, that obviously make a fine-grained um, um, classification to identify your um, taste for music and to propose the things that you, you want to hear. Uh, obviously, there is a trade-off uh, in the sense that uh, the more information you give to the platform, the more data you share about yourself and the more knowledge the platform will extract from this data and provide a more targeted product or service, okay? So obviously in the coarse grain classification, uh, uh, you also have a, a drawback that people may say, well, that's uh, the service or the product that you propose to me or the advertising or whatever is not accurate enough. And that's correct because you do not want to have it very accurate. If you want to be to have it accurate, you should allow them to profile you at fine grain uh, in the, let's say, up to the last uh, bit. There is other, other, actually another technique that could be used in this uh, trade-off between fine grain data collection or coarse grain that could be privacy preserving methods. If you look at what uh, has been done in a uh, uh, for doing research in biomedical context, let's say for vaccine, what do they do? They take, let's say <clears throat> 10,000 people, they profile them, they know exactly the age, the medical history and so on. And then they inject these, uh, these shots and then they figure out if they work or if they don't, the side effect. And they do it respecting the privacy because they do not link the data, the registry of the human being with their pathology, their clinical history, uh, their uh, lifestyle and the, 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 the job that they had. Okay, uh, So it's possible to do 
uh, let's say, privacy preserving, uh, but obviously none of these companies want to do it because they, they, they all, <laughs> the game in town is profiling users, okay? And it is the, and the, uh, the finest grain that you can do it. And the more they know about myself or yourself, and the more they give targeted service and product. So it's difficult then to complain and to say, well, you know too much about me because, well, uh, that's the game in town and we have decided to play it. The privacy preserving say that, uh, at least that's my understanding that they have to tell you that they are playing this game and you agree that they play this game with you. Uh, so sometimes I also a bit concerned because when I see, at least for the Italian uh, um, side that I know more, uh, let's say some of the Italian authorities attacking some of these digital platform on privacy ground, they almost never they catch up them or that they do something that is illegal because they are not, sorry, so, <laughs> so stupid. They know how to read the law and they apply strictly the law. The point is that they don't tell us or everybody else what they do with the data that they collect, full stock. Okay, uh, but the, uh, this remind me a, a chat that a couple of years ago we shown uh, when I was visiting CCP. <laughs> uh, he told me that, uh, um, so I was mentioning that since they cannot catch this company on privacy infringement, they try with uh, um, competitive, uh, uh, anti-competitive behavior. And sometimes they have more success on this because I believe the law is better written than the privacy. Sorry for people working on privacy. Um, and then he, he told me, uh, and then we were laughing uh, behind the cup of coffee, uh, about the fact that Al Capone in Chicago was put in jail for um, tax evasion, not for anti-mafia because the, uh, the US government didn't have the right law, the right tools to put him in jail. And he told me that before using tax evasion uh, uh, motivation, they use antitrust law, but it didn't work at that time. Okay. Uh, so th th thanks very much, Danilo. And uh, time is running short. And uh, a big thank you to all the panelists and attendees. We've managed to answer all the questions in the chat box and Q&A. I will now uh, hand over to Amelia to close out this session. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Wynne, and to all of the excellent speakers. Another very, very good session. Uh, we now have a break. Um, it's uh, just under 15 minutes. We all need to be back.